G, welcome to Britain's Rare Guitars. Hi Lars, great to see you again mate. Just before lockdown happened, you were about to go on the road with the Howie G Band to promote your new album, Masters of the Night. That must have been quite disappointing. Um, well yeah, we had um, quite a few shows booked and everything was binned. Um, I, I also had a tour with Biff Byford from Saxon. I was one of his guitar players for the, the School of Hard Knocks tour. That was binned as well, so... Yeah, yeah, it's all it's all very disappointing. It's good company, my shadow. 
never lets me down my shadow Oh, my shadow Lucky enough towards the end of last year to have you play live at Britain's Rare Guitars live show in Wigan where you played quite a few tracks from that album which we're going to play some snippets of video during this interview. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was a great, great show. It was uh, a great thing to be a part of. The stage setup was wonderful. Um, all the other people that were uh, that were playing there were great. Um, I particularly liked Phil Harris and his stories and his Les Pauls and and it was nice to sing with him as well. It's the darkest hour of the darkest night. It's a million miles from the morning light. Can't get no sleep. Some great instruments on display as well. The Jeff Waters Annihilator guitar was fabulous. Um, the 1918 Gibson harp guitar that was there as well. That was also, oh, just mind-blowing show. Great, really enjoyed it. I first met you uh, personally a few years ago when you were touring with the Classic Rock Show, often been described as some of the finest session players and singers from around the world playing uh, iconic tracks from hard rock albums. I was quite stunned how many guitars you had on stage to get the authentic sound from each song, from delicate mandolin to full on humbucker through, through angry amp, without having too much on the floor, as in rows and rows of pedals, it all came from the fingers. When it first started, there were three guitar players. There was myself, Damien Darlington, and Bobby Harrison. Um, Bobby, had a kind of half digital, half analog rig. Uh, Damien's rig was pretty much all digital and mine was all analog. Um, so that gave a kind of good spread. And so everybody kind of had their own job to do. And I generally just stuck with that. And after Bobby left and Damien left and we had a few other different guitar players come in, Edo Scordo and James Cole and Alex D, um, I just stuck with the analog rig. And I've always been like that. I've never put too much digital stuff in there. I mean, I've got a, I've got an old Boss processor on the floor um, that gives me like a master volume and some reverb, some chorus, some delay and stuff when I need it. But that's pretty much it. If I want any tonal changes, I change guitars. I've got loads and loads of them. And I think that's the best way to do it. You know, a Telecaster is always going to sound like a Telecaster. A Les Paul is always going to sound like a Les Paul. Um, I don't think you really have to do that much to it. As long as you've got a nice, sweet amp tone and don't really change it that much. I never change it from guitar to guitar. I just set the amp up as I think it should sound for me. 
um, and then I just switched guitars. We've talked for hours on the phone late at night, um, <laughs> many times, about tone, amps, guitars, um, different rigs on the floor, and you, you do have some special ways of, of rigging up your pedals. I can't get around my head if you're a tone head, a tech head, neither or both. <laughs> I don't know what either of those is. I don't know. Can you explain what a tone head or a tech head is? Right, a tone head. Let's get to stuff from a tone head. You're interested in or fanatical about the body woods, the fingerboard woods, the sonic characteristics of the tone wood that the pickups deliver to the amps and then you get to the amp and you want to know about the capacitors and the rigs and things like that. Which, which way? Or do you not care at all? Um, I know very little about the woods that the guitars are made of, um, but I do know a bit about the pickups. Um, I changed the pickups on pretty much every guitar I've got. Um, uh, main reason that I started changing pickups is because I've got like quite aggressive sweat. And so I kind of go through pickups and bridges and saddles and things like that. And uh, as you can see on the Les Paul here, you know, there's, we'll get to that in a minute. There's some serious wear going on there. That's all due to that as well. So I have to have covered up pickups. So like in the Strats, I like the lace sensors. Um, and on the Gibsons, if I have just the pickup ribbon exposed, then the sweat will go through that. So I have to either wrap it in gaffer tape or put a cover on it or something. So I got into changing pickups that way. Um, and when I do change pickups, I generally go for the highest output I can possibly get, um, which is kind of aggressive, but that's what the volume controls for. You can always back it off. You know, um, with regards to yeah, yeah. tech head, um, I'm a bit of an electrical guy, you know, so I understand all about magnetic fields and this and that and the other and the way that um, the pickups have to hit the front end of the amp just right to make it sound right. I, I, I don't understand all about it, but I know how it makes a difference. Um, the, uh, the sort of, the, the signal path, um, is what I'm most interested in. So I, I have my top row of pedals and uh, go through the, the tuner first, obviously, uh, and then the wah-wah. Um, compressor occasionally for clean sounds, um, particularly for doing the clean Mark Knopfler stuff like Telegraph Road that we did with the Classic Rock Show, which was absolutely great to do. That had the, the Keeley compressor on all the time, um, almost completely clean. And then I've got um, an MXR Phase 90, a Tube Screamer, um, an Ibanez Parametric EQ, um, a Boss NS2 Noise Suppressor, and then that goes into the front end of the amp. And then in the effects loop, I've got the Boss GT5. I prefer the GT5 to the GT6, GT10, GT whatever it is nowadays, because it um, doesn't affect the natural decay of the note. Some of the later processors um, have got an inbuilt like noise suppressor or limiter or something in there that you can't switch off. So if you just want the note to feed back and go sort of infinitely variably to nothing, it gets to a certain point and then just cuts it off dead. And I don't like that at all. So I stick with the old GT5 and I've got three of them. Um, I've actually got a brand new one, which is new old stock from 1997 that I bought off eBay a couple of years ago that had only been used about three times since it was brand new. So I'm very fortunate to have that. Um, but they're not that easy to come by anymore, so I, I make sure I've got spares. But yeah, so I don't, like the, I don't like the decay of the note going away, so I use the old school stuff. That's my signal path. So maybe I'm more of a tech head than a tone head, but I get all the tone 
from the guitars themselves and from how I squeeze the strings, really, I think. <laughs> you finished up with the last couple of lines there, from hand to heart to fingers, how I guessed um, in the beginning. Have you got the red strat there loaded with the lace pickup? So I just want to talk about that one for a sec. Yeah, sure. Um, it's right here, Lars's favourite guitar. Here we are. Now, I first got to know you, as I say, came to see you at the Classic Rock Show, but first found out about you when I was analysing Bob Dylan's um, All Along the Watchtower, the way Hendrix does it. I'm quite fascinated with that song. You can bend notes and they just do not, do not seem to be out of tune. But with the way you work this one, there's a YouTube folks out there of this, you've got to see this. The way you work the wow wow with that neck pickup, I have to have a cold shower now and again, now and again. It's, it's fantastic. That's partly to do with body balance more than anything. So I use, I use the wow wow with my left foot. Obviously, I'm a right handed player. So I'm, I'm sort of stood kind of sideways like that. And I'm just rocking, trying to rock backwards and forwards in time. I don't, I'm not really conscious of what I'm doing while I'm doing it. Um, but there are certain things like on the, the diddle, 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 that lick, that's got to be whack, tick, whack, tick, whack, tick, whack, tick, whack. That's got to be absolutely in time um, to get that right. I yeah. think that's how Hendrix did it. The thing is, with the with the Hendrix version of that song, there are so many effects in there, and obviously the 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 twelve string slide that he uses at the start of the main solo, um, that's impossible to recreate on a six string. Obviously, um, also with the classic rock show, we did it in B minor, uh, whereas the original's in C minor concert pitch, but played in C sharp minor because he tuned down a semitone. So there are certain notes that aren't available on open strings in B minor that would be available in C sharp minor. So the, there are certain compromises that have to be made there. Uh, but with the, with the wah wah thing and with the effects, I I stick the tube screamer on. Um, I have all stages of amp overdrive on. Um, I occasionally kick the MXR phase ninety in as well. Um, the wah wah thing is just it, it's improvisational really. But I just try and keep it in time, like I said, with the body balance, rocking backwards and forwards. And also the way I have my pedal board set up, it's a, a bit of an angle like that. And the wah-wah is quite proud of all the other pedals, so I can put my full weight on it. And it's just sort of almost, it's almost like dancing on the pedal. That's great, and I like the way you flick around with the selector switch between the pickups, uh, like Hendrix did, and Stevie Ray, and Richie Blackmore, of course. So they're obviously influenced you, those those players, when you were growing up. Who else influenced you? Well, you've got to think, I, I grew up in the 90s. Um, that was my, I started playing guitar at Christmas 1989. So um, around that time, that was when all the heavy metal guys and the guitar solos were just being removed from pop music. Um, the only sort of real Flash lead player you had at the time on, in singles was probably Slash. And so, like, the solo from Sweet Child of Mine was the holy grail for the players at school, you know, if you could play that, it, it was amazing. But uh, also at the time, there was a lot of, like, charity concerts and like the Prince's Trust and Nordoff Robbins Music Therapy at Nebworth and all that sort of thing. And the two main players were Eric Clapton and Mark Knopfler that I could see at the time. They were the most visible players to me. So I got into Clapton, I got into Knopfler, and, and from there I got into Queen because uh, my best friend, a um, guy called Paul Carnavali, a drummer who I was at school with, who I still play with now um, from time to time, um, he was a massive Queen fan. And um, so that got me into watching the Freddie Mercury tribute concert. And obviously there were loads of people on that that I hadn't seen before. One of which 
being Tony Iommi. And when I saw him, I was like, oh, he, he looks interesting. Who's that? And I went down to my local music shop and I said, who was that guy that was playing the Black SG with Brian May at the tribute concert? And he said, oh, that's Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath. Go and buy yourself Paranoid. So I went and bought the Paranoid album on vinyl. And life changed then. I became um, more into the heavier side of things. Um, so I loved Sabbath and I loved Zeppelin. Um, I got into White Snake a bit as well. So there was kind of the bluesy thing going on. Um, obviously, Deep Purple. I loved the In Rock album. Um, that, uh, that riff from Into the Fire has got to be one of my favourite Blackmore riffs of all time. Um, that album's just totally seminal album brilliant um, but I, I've got lots of influences from lots of different places and I just kind of add them all together so it's like Iommi Brian May Clapton Knopfler Stevie Ray Hendrix Billy Gibbons Gary Moore
the main thing that I like about guitar players is if whether or not they can pass the traffic light test. This was something that I've read in a magazine many, many years ago. You're on holiday, you've got yourself a nice hire car, roof down, somebody pulls up next to you in another convertible and they've got a guitar player playing at the traffic lights. You've got two or three seconds to be able to identify that guitar player before you both go in your different directions. There are certain guitar players that can pass the traffic light test and certain guitar players that can't. Every single one of my influences can pass the traffic light test instantly. I forgot to mention David Gilmore as well. That's why I bought this strap because I was going to be working a bit with Brett Floyd. Um, and he was on at the Nebworth concert that I mentioned in 1990, the Nordoff Robbins Music Therapy concert. Pink Floyd headlined it and he was playing a strap in a not dissimilar colour to this with the maple neck and the, the covered pickups. I don't know if they were lace sensors or not. You'd probably be able to tell me. Um, but it looked very much like this. So I wanted a guitar like that because that was my first image of David Gilmour. So that's where this strap came from. Excellent. Good answer. Good answer. Just have a, look, a quick look at the gold top there. Oh, um, of course. Goldie. You, you played Ooh. the red strat a lot at the BRG live show, but you used this one throughout um, all the Rocky numbers. I couldn't quite see what model was. Is it naturally distressed or is it a distressed No, model? no, 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 no. All the wear on this is me. Um, I got this in 1996. It's a 1990 model. It's a custom shop, um, and it was used originally by Brooks St. James from Taiketo, who's a very good friend of mine to this day. Um, we became friends back then, and w when I turned 18, um, I got some money for my 18th birthday, and uh, I spent the majority of it on guitars. I bought this one uh, off Brook. This was 1,700 quid, um, which is a lot of money for an 18 year old in 1996. Um, I bought my 68 SG and my Series 1 Parker Fly and a couple of other bits. Um, I was very fortunate um, to, to get that money when I was 18. It was like a, a trust fund thing. Um, and, you know, I, I, like I say, I spent most of it on guitars. But th this one, um, it wasn't my main guitar to start with because I bought a lot of nice guitars all at the same time. But it didn't take long to become my main guitar because I just kept going back to it. Um, the wear on it, all the distress, um, it's actually a gold bullion, not a gold top. Um, so you can see it's gold on the back and it used to be gold all down the neck as well, but that's all gone. Um, because of me, <laughs> my sweat and overuse of things and kind of a, a, aggressive way of handling stuff. I, I think it's, a, it's partly the sweat and partly that I don't know my own strength because I do break things and um, quite easily when it comes to guitars this is its fourth bridge um it's its fourth bridge pickup um it's had several um uh treble pickup volume sorry bridge pickup volume parts because i wreck them as well i pull strap buttons out i'm dreadful i'm, I'm just but it handles it you know it can it can really take the punishment i mean if you i don't know if you can see on the camera but if you if you look at the frets they're not just pitted they're actually drawn across where i bend the strings because i push the string so far into the fret when i bend the lower strings that it actually makes the metal go in a ripple like that it really does need a refret but i'm, I'm not keen on having it done until it's absolutely necessary because i'm just so comfortable with the way it plays give it to somebody else and they can't play it in tune but i can because it's me that's worn the bugger out <laughs> Me, I know you 
I've actually got a copy of the album here. It's looking real. If I hold it up to the, uh, my camera here, hopefully folks can see there's Howie leaning against this cool truck. I love that truck. What is it? What is it? What is that truck? Um, that truck is a 1993 Chevrolet G30 long wheelbase. Um, it's one of very, very few that were ever brought over to the UK and one of very, very few that were ever made in that specification. Your normal Chevy truck's 125 inch wheelbase. This is 146. It's enormous. It's absolutely enormous. It's also got the, the big block 7.4 engine in it. And um, I, it's got a bit of a history, actually. That's the reason I ended up with it. Um, I, I randomly went to buy a second hand car many, many years ago. Um, when I was at home in Reading, um, staying with my uncle Andrew, um, an old Volvo estate. And I got there and this guy had a, a smaller Chevy van in his workshop, identical to a Chevy van that I used to own. I've been into Chevy vans all my life. I'm a big fan of them. Anyway, so we got talking and he says, uh, why do you want this big Volvo estate then? I said, uh, well, I'm a guitar player. I need something that's big enough for me to be able to stand 4 by 12s up in the back of it. He said, oh, right, I'm a guitar player as well. I said, oh, that's interesting. He said, uh, have a look at that black jag in the corner over there in the workshop um, and see if, you can, see if you can figure out who that belongs to. Tell me who that belongs to. So I went and had a look, and it was a beautiful black um, 4.2-litre supercharged S-type, brand new at the time. Um, I couldn't identify who it belonged to, and he said, uh, that belongs to Malcolm Young from ACDC. I've been ACDC's personal chauffeur for 33 years. And I was like, mm. <laughs> brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And he, he was also Deep Purple chauffeur, um, good friends with uh, the late, great John Lord. Um, he was also uh, Gary Moore's chauffeur. He was the guy that drove Gary Moore to the airport the weekend that he died. Um, also Hank Marvin's chauffeur. Apparently the Chevy truck was um, one of Hank Marvin's favourite vehicles to be driven around in. Anyway, he got a picture of this truck on the wall in the office and I asked him about it. I said, I've never seen one like that. He said, they didn't make many of them. I had it made specifically for these people, for these contracts that I'd got. It's like a one-off build. But he'd sold it years before I met him. Anyway, it came up on eBay a couple of years ago and I was like, that's David's old truck. That's the ACDC wagon. That's the deep purple wagon. I'm having it. And so I drove 665 miles in one day, all the way up to Dundee, visited the Bon Scott uh, Memorial at Kiri Muir as well uh, while I was up there. So yeah, drove all the way up to Dundee to, to view this truck and um, I just absolutely had to have it. It's a rolling restoration. It's not in perfect nick, but it's usable. And uh, once we get back on the road again, stick a trailer on the back of it and it's the band van it's being used for what it was used for in the first place 
and designed for in the first place and so I think it's gone to the right home being my truck. I love it, it's brilliant and it's fabulous to drive. <laughs> about the album for a minute did you write all the tracks yourself how much was it did you, were you involved was it a band thing was it did you all produce it write it i was the producer um i was also the pretty much the sole lyric writer um the music was developed over a long period of time some years ago with uh, a lineup that i had called the howie g review um which was the same drummer alex tomkinson on the drums but a different bass player and different keyboard player um that that lineup had to be put on on sort of hold because uh, our keyboard player at the time, this is going all the way back to about 2013, um, our keyboard player, Mark, he, he had a stroke. Um, so that basically canned it. And so the backing tracks were, were in the studio, um, sat on the shelf for about six years. And it wasn't until I met um, my, man my now manager, Mike, uh, a couple of years ago, um, he suggested that they should come out of the studio and should get completed, but I needed new personnel to do that. Um, as far as the writing is concerned, it's, I wouldn't say it's all me, but I come up with the riffs and I come up with all the lyrics, um, but I take it to the band and see what they can sort of bring out of my ideas and they put their own parts to it and people suggest time changes or, um, you know, like dynamic changes and where should we put this? Can you make that verse longer? Can you make this chorus a double one at the end? That sort of thing. But largely the writing is is mine. Where can folks buy the album, Howie? Where's the best place from? It's available on Amazon, Spotify, Deezer, um, you can you can you can buy hard copy directly from my website, which is www.howieg.co.uk. Thanks ever so much, Howie. We'll speak to you soon, and I think we're about to play out with one of your videos at BRG Live. Thanks very much, Lars. Great talking to you again, buddy. See you soon. While the young man shouts, the old man said, "Smile, as the pain is coming out." We all go through changes When I was young I couldn't see Looking back from the mirror Looking back from the mirror Looking back from the mirror The wise man could be me To be a wiser man Does anybody understand? Oh. Don't know if you can. Thank you.